uh, today uh, we are still continuing with the assessment health assessment and we are continuing with the, the anatomy we are starting with the anatomy of the skin but this topic is basically on the engagementary assessment and when you look at this topic it looks mostly on skin and the previous topic we had was about the head neck and the lymphatics so i realized that was very good for us to continue with it in this way so we are going to look at um, the intangimentary system which is handling the skin and when you look at the skin the skin is not basically what people all think about but the skin can also look at uh, the membranes can look at whatever is on the surface of the human body so i want us to start with the anatomy of the skin and um, i think most of us have already done the anatomy or we had done before in the other trains that you have ever had so the anatomy of the skin is basically having three layers and the those three layers is the epidermis which is on the surface as on the surface of your body is the epidermis then the, the dermis is the next layer which is the middle one and then the hypodermis which is the inside so when you look at the layer realize there are basically three um when you look at the, the anatomy of the skin you realize basically three types of uh the layers so the intangimental thing that I'm looking at i mean system is basically looking at uh, the skin so we are looking to do a health assessment on the skin and previously we handled um the head nails I mean head, neck, and the lymphatic uh, assessment. Then we also did the skin, nails, and the hair. How to assess those different parts in our bodies. So today we are going to look at the intangimentary uh, system assessment in general. So we want to start with the anatomy. As I've mentioned, we look at the anatomy of the skin. And when you look at the anatomy of the skin, you're going to realize that it has basically three layers. And those three layers follow each other. The one on top is called the epidermis. Then you follow with the dermis, and the inside most is the hypodermis. So the skin surface area is basically thick. So it has some kind of thickness that um, contains these uh, three layers: the epidermis, dermis, and the hypodermis. Then also within the skin, uh, you realize that you have the glands. And this glands helps to produce the sebaceous um, substance, and also it has uh, the sweat glands. So when you sweat, it doesn't mean that uh, that sweat or that fluid is coming from inside, but it comes from basically around your skin, because our skin contains the sweat glands, which help to separate uh, the sweat. And then the equipment and the checklist. What are you going to have when you're going to do? The assessment are uh, on the integumentary system which is based on the skin so uh, you can have a list of equipments that are required for examination and here you can have the thermometer that you're going to use for checking the temperature you can also decide to have it depending on what you're going to assess on your patient so if you're going to assess maybe the patient is having uh, maybe any infection, then you're going to have most of the equipment that can help you get the assessment from the patient. Because sometimes our patients can come with different complaints, or that they're having skin infections, and we are able to pick assessment from the skin. So it depends on what you are going to do to assess and also perform different procedures that we perform on our patients so the equipments will depend on what you are going to perform and the procedure you're going to do on your patient so you need to know what you are going to have so before you go to the patient you're supposed to have a checklist whereby you're going to actually check on what you have depending on the procedure you're going to have before you go to the patient because when you're going to your patient you should not go to the patient again you walk away that you're going to look for something um, any, any, any equipment that you might have missed 
and the patient may get pissed off or the patient may feel you're incompetent or you don't know what you're doing. So you have to know that you need this and this kind of tool or equipment before you go to your patient. So there should be a checklist that you should see before you go to the patient. Then also you should be having a checklist that will help you carry out the procedure. Because every procedure has a checklist depending on what you are going to do to the patient. So in that checklist, it will always show you the different steps that you're supposed to follow, the key things or the key areas that you should not miss when you're going to carry out that procedure. So the checklist is basically to guide and to help you not to miss out what you're supposed to do on that procedure to your patient. And when you talk about the skin inspection, I will have to inspect the skin of your patients and when you inspect the skin you can be able to see or to observe anything that is abnormal on the surface of the skin of your patient. So you should be able to note out what you have observed. As you observe the skin of the patient you can see maybe it has rashes or it has uh, blisters or it has um, maybe a rash or scars what could have happened that it has either a rash what could have happened that maybe it has um uh, it has a scar was there any injury trauma and so forth so on inspection you're supposed to observe and also note down a few points that can help you understand maybe the problem on what is happening on the integumentary system of your patient then deviations from normal skin colors and conditions you know there are normal colors of people if someone is dark then that person will have a dark color throughout if the person a person is light skinned or a person is uh, brown then also um, the color should be uh, uniform but in most cases if a person has a problem with his skin or her skin then you can realize that there is deviation of the color of the skin the normal one from deviates from the normal one to abnormal so you realize uh the patient may even tell you that i have been brown but this side is becoming black and i don't know why or uh, i'm a dark person but i'm seeing their patches of brown brown um skin or coloration in this part of my body and there you may suspect your patient has a problem so on skin ins inspection you're supposed to look at um, the general appearance of your patient's skin and you have to note down what you have observed so you look at the color comparing the normal one plus any deviation that might have occurred and you can be able to tell uh, the condition on what your patient is suffering from and then the body structure and assessment. So observations on height, nutrition, BMI, uh, symmetry, posture, and mobility is also very key for you to assess in the body structure of your patient. So the height of the patient matters depending on um, what you are looking out for and depending on the situation of your patient. I want to give an example of uh, the height for the case of our obstetric and gain, you realize a very short woman may not be able to deliver normally, and that's what they tell us. So when you observe that, you can be able to tell the structure of the pelvis of these mothers, and you can advise them on the mode of delivery, and there you should have helped this mother and the baby. Then also on the side of nutrition, you have to assess the nutritional status of your mother, or the nutritional status of any patient because every person who has poor nutrition may also not heal uh, very fast it affects uh, the healing process because when someone feeds the person is able to get a uh, proteins person is able to get vitamins that help to repair the worn out tissues and also if a person has a wound the person can be able to heal very fast when they eat um a lot of protein so the nutritional status also you have to assess and the bmi very big people very small so you have to assess and advise them accordingly because when someone is also very big or very fat it can also cause problems with some of these chronic conditions 
like hypertension and diabetes. Then if someone is also very small, it can also affect the healing process if someone is sick. Or it can also affect the baby if the woman is pregnant because uh, if someone is very small, then you should look at uh, the nutrition. How is this person feeding? What could be the conditions surrounding this person and so forth? Then symmetry is just like uh, the structure or the appearance, the way that the person is. Maybe one side of the body is bigger than the other, this other side is smaller, or the person is lame, this other leg, the other one is okay. So it depends on how the body structure of that person is. So symmetry is being in a normal size in all parts of your body. Then asymmetry can be like a deformity, or it can be a deviation, one side is actually bigger one side is smaller depending on what structures you are looking for in somebody and the posture also matters and then the mobility mobility is basically uh, the movements is this person able to move is he able to walk is he able to stand and take a step so mobility is just basically looking at the movement of an individual so looking at the body structures you have to look at maybe the lower limbs is someone able to stand walk or the person is having a problem with the back that can make me make someone fail to move or to walk depending on either an injury or it can be a deformity which is inborn and this is a problem to our patients so you have to note all these abnormalities and their potential implications so you realize that um, when someone has an abnormality, an abnormality is not there just like it doesn't cause a problem, but most of the abnormalities that our clients come with or they complain for always have uh, different implications that may affect uh, the lives of our clients or our patients. So in case you identify any abnormality from your patient, it's better for you to always make sure that you note it down so that you can be able to address it at the end of it all. Then also the behavior, the dressing, and the personal hygiene. So you also have to assess this. You have to see the behavior of your patient. The person may come to you and is behaving weirdly. Either he looks scared. And there are some funny behaviors that may make you uh, feel is this person having a normal mental status or so it can lead you to a certain kind of uh, maybe understanding or suspicion on how your patient is behaving and the way the person dresses also matters uh, our dressing codes matter so when a person comes to you, you can tell what could be happening in the life of this patient and also their personal hygiene because personal hygiene also contributes a lot so when someone's personal hygiene is poor, then you can also be able to depict uh, maybe uh, this person is predisposing himself or herself to certain infections that are caused by poor personal hygiene. And for the case of the ladies, you have to look at so many things and there you can be able to advise them accordingly because personal hygiene, most people get UTIs and a frequent UTIs can also implicate uh, something else in, during the time of reproduction and so forth. So people think UTIs are basically on the urinary tract infection, but they can also progress and someone gets it on the reproductive system, depending on the causative microorganism. So we have to advise our clients, talk to them in a friendly way for them to understand that it's very, very important for them to keep their personal hygiene good or clean um we have to assess the behavior mood speech and the facial expression as i've already mentioned and when you do this you'll be able to actually pick something on what your patient is going through some patients can come to you and they will not speak but the way they behave can tell you there is something wrong and you can be able to actually dig deeper to find out the whole issue and then uh, evaluating the attire, appropriateness, uh, personal hygiene, and then grooming standards. How is the patient presenting to you? Grooming is basically the outlook of the patient 
the cleanliness of the patient and the organization of the way he's dressed and just even the body. So it is very key for you to look at all this, for you to manage to assess the body structure of your patient because this can show you so many things happening in the life of your patient. Um, the introduction to integumentary uh, system, we just want to introduce this and go into other things uh, besides what we have already talked, the body structure and then uh, the anatomy of the skin. So, a uh, brief overview of what uh, the integumentary system comprises of is the skin, hair and the nails. And I remember we talked about this previously in the previous session. We talked about how we can assess the skin, the hair and the nails. And as I started in the introduction, I said um, this system is not only looking at the skin, but whatever is covering the entire body of a human being. And you see the hair is also part of what covers our bodies. And the nails is part of what is covering our bodies. So when you look at your nails on your fingers, on your toes, it is covering your body because it is on the surface. So it's more or less like the skin on that particular area of your fingers. So the importance of patient communication, consent, and procedure explanation. We should know that it's very important uh, for the patient to communicate or for us to communicate with our patients. And it is also very key for our patients to consent for whatever procedure we do to them. Never just take come and examine someone or give treatment to someone when you have not uh, get, gotten a consent from your client or from your patient. So get consents from individuals before you start providing them any services because they can easily refuse your service and they have a right to refuse your service. So um, communicate to them, create that rapport, have a good relationship, patient to nurse or physician to patient relationship and get a consent if they have accepted you to touch them and to go on to assess them or provide your service to them and then also explain the procedure and by you getting a consent you must have explained the procedure to the patient tell him why you're going to do that tell him what you're going to do exactly tell him the implications and let him or her decide and accept for you to provide other service um there are some common skin disorders and i think some of us if we have been with patients most of us may have seen as some patients presenting to us with some of these conditions psoriasis is basically chronic disease with marked epidermal thickening so it just causes thickening of the epidermis So the epidermis is basically the top part of our have three layers. So the first layer on the top surface is the epidermis. So you realize uh, the skin has its normal thickness, but then uh, according to this disease, it causes it to thicken beyond the normal expected uh, thickness of the skin. Then also contact dermatitis. Uh, contact dermatitis is just the inflammation of the dermis, which is also part of the skin. When you look at the skin, we have a different uh, parts in the skin. So there is the dermis, uh, which is one of the parts in the skin. So there is an inflammation in that particular area. And that's why they call it dermatitis. So anything ending with T's, T-I-S, means it is inflammation. So this is the inflammation uh, on that part of the skin. So it is an inflammatory disorder due to irritants. Irritants are basically any substance that can uh, maybe get in touch of on your skin and then it irritates your skin and it gets inflamed. An inflammation is just the body trying to re react to that irritant, then it gets swollen because now it's trying to release some defense mechanism for you to respond to whatever is irritating your body. So by the end of it all, it ends up with that inflammation causing the condition of uh, dermatitis. Then um, we have at carrier, at carrier in brackets, they have said how hives, hives, and this is basically relation to allergy. So the hives they are talking about, um, if someone has ever had, um, I can say uh, chicken pox, 
that is an example i can give uh, if you see a patient with chicken pox the way those blisters come and you realize in most cases they can decide to fix themselves in one in one part and then they end up like being on top of each other that's why they call it the hives but it's mostly in relation to allergic reactions where someone reacts and then the person gets those um, skin kind of um swellings on top of the body and you can really see it physically even when you have touched it and when you touch it you feel there is that roughness on somebody's uh, skin so that is what they call at carrier some people when it is very cold their skins react to that so when it reacts they get those kind of hives and they get just on top of the body and you realize the skin is rough when you touch it you even feel it some of them it even itches the person feels like it is itching and there are swellings each on top of each other and the skin is rough other people say when they pass near maybe some flowers some kind of um grass they react and they get this urticaria then freckles uh this are their proper kind of rash and then cellulitis some of us might have seen in our babies they end up with those kind of rashes when they put on diapers for a long time and you don't change which is not a good habit for our children to have this kind of experience because some of them can end up even having uh, something like um, a, a wound in fact when that rash wears off it ends up being like sort of an ulcer which is not good for us mothers to see our babies like that and i think also to the fathers i don't think you'll be happy seeing your baby has been put on a diaper and the skin has weared off and it looks like just a wound red in color so uh it is not good for us to keep babies for a long time without changing the diapers they end up having this kind of a uh, skin uh, infection then cellulitis cellulitis um it's more of um an inflammation but for it it ends up forming pus beneath the skin and when it forms pus it ends up even eating a lot of um, soft tissues within a particular part of the body and likes where there is a lot of fat that's where cellulitis comes in so it is inflammation of the cells in a certain particular part of the body but looking at uh, the areas where there is a lot of what fat it can be on the thighs and when they do um incision they do drainage they remove the pus it ends up with just a hole sort of uh, a deep wound so uh it's a very bad kind of infection that some people can get and can even fail to heal and then in petigo and then sarcoma and all this this ones uh, sometimes uh, you realize people get this kind of infections the sarcoma mostly uh, the majority of them have low immunities and the hiv clients uh, are likely to have this kind due to opportunistic infections uh, in relation to their low immune system and then the malignant kind of melanoma melanoma is basically the skin melanin and the when someone gets a melanoma it means the person's skin has gotten a cancer so um you can look at these other infections some tinea baba is an infection like a ringworm which people get on their heads and then this other tinea corporis that one also is just more or less of um an infection that people get in relation to maybe uh, on their legs and so forth so when you don't attend to them they can become chronic and you can easily give to any other person that's why sometimes people don't need to share clothes people don't need to share shoes anyhow and people don't need even sleeping sharing the same bed with someone who has this you can also easily get it then the hapizostas and spodis hapizosta uh, is also a viral infection some people can get it if they are hiv positive but also there are other viral infections that can cause hapizostas but there are those ones that are specifically uh, for hiv clients and scabies we all know what scabies is 
sometimes people mistake scabies to be um to be um hello so you have to look at all this and when you're able to differentiate then you can be able to tell what the condition is and the patient can easily be managed but if you fail to identify and differentiate then you can be uh, actually misfiring in the management and your patient will continue complaining uh, the skin is not improving um, the treatment is not working and you may not know that you misfired in the diagnosis and you mistook either certain condition of the skin to be the one that you're treating and it was something else that was different from what you're assuming. Um, I want us to also talk about bleeding. Uh, there is bleeding, then there is echimosis and vascularity. So I don't find different types of these echolorations and vascular conditions is very important. So uh, these conditions can be either lesions, it can be form of moisture and it can be form of temperature. So sometimes uh, these conditions can be caused due to either lesions, then someone bleeds. It can be due to maybe moisture or it can be due to high temperatures. So there are so many factors that can contribute to some of these conditions, especially the bleeding on your skin, the chymosis. And chymosis, somebody may wonder what is chymosis. Actually, chymosis is base color condition that um, our patients can develop whereby the skin, uh, there is bleeding beneath the skin. You see the skin is red and when you touch, you don't touch the blood, but you see there is blood beneath uh, the skin of your patient and that one is called a chymosis. So assessment of skin lesions, moisture levels, and temperature variations is good and is very important if you want to assess uh, the condition of your patient in relation to the intangimentary assisting. So the skin texture, you should also know what the skin texture is all about. How should somebody's normal skin be when you touch it? Then the tagger of the skin is also very important. You should also assess the tagger or the turgidity of the patient's skin and also oedema. Patients, people are not supposed to have oedema, but if someone comes with oedema, then you should be able to examine and assess what kind of oedema, what level of oedema, and what has caused the oedema and manage it accordingly. Then details about assessing skin texture is very key. Tagger and then the different types of oedema. So we want to look at the nails. When you look at the nails, the nails also have their anatomy and the components. So deviations from the normal nail conditions can also show us that there is a problem and most of the people's nails are actually affected by the fungi. So you see the person's nails are either darkening or the nails are clubbed or the nails are actually wanting to, to get off from the bed, from its bed. So you realize there is a problem with these nails, either the person has a fungal infection or even the person just hit his nail and after that it has gotten uh, damage from the bed and it is blacking. So you need to look at that and you see how is it deviating from the normal uh, nail condition and handle it accordingly depending on the, um, the cause. So nail inspection, you're supposed to inspect these nails. You don't just say, ah, your nail should be having a fungal infection and yet you have not inspected, you have not examined, you have not even asked any questions of the patient to respond to tell you that exactly what your meaning is true. So you have to inspect these uh, nails, assess, uh, you have to assess the nail, the color of the nails. The nails are supposed to be white or somehow a pink, but you find some people have dark nails. So you should be able to find out why is someone having dark nails. Then also you have to, to assess for the capillary refill. Capillary refill, you press uh, the nail. Then after you press the nail, you see there's a return back, I mean, a return flow of blood covering where you pressed. Because when you press, it becomes white. Then after you pressed, it will get back to pink. So the, that is called the capillary refill. So what is the capillary refill? Is it slow or it is fast or it is uh, moderate? 
So when you press it, you're able to assess even for anemia from your patient. So capillary refill is very important as you're examining your patient's nails. Then look at for any abnormality that could be on the nails. And I've mentioned about fungal infections. So you'll see either the nail is black and is maybe wanting to get off. So that one is not actually normal. Uh, then uh, still continue with the brief uh, overview of hair anatomy. So you have to assess uh, the hair of your patient, look at the color, the distribution of the hair, and also the deviations. So when you see the hair of your patient, but it is not a normal color, either it is uh, brown, it is very slippery, and yet this patient you expect to be having a dark hair or black, it may not be very dark, but at least a black color of hair, and the hair has to be well distributed, then you should be suspecting this patient has a problem. And sometimes people who get those uh, kind of brown hairs can be maybe having malnutrition. Some of them can be due to other low immune infections like HIV clients are the ones who have gotten to that term low state. Some of them end up with a change in their hair, the color, the texture, and also the distribution. And also note that alone, there are other conditions that can also contribute to uh, those uh, kind of um, abnormalities on our patient's hair. So you have to take detailed uh, history and also do examinations to find out why your patient is having that deviation or abnormal kind of hair. Um, the head and the face assessment, you have to inspect and palpate at the head and the face of your patient. And when you're palpating the head, you're trying to find out um, at the sutures, you're going to find out uh, the fontanelles. I want to give an example for the case of the babies. You have to look at the fontanelles because you very well know these fontanelles have to close or to stop pulsating at a certain point or the certain age. But when you pul palpate uh, the fontanelle and you find uh, this child is more than 18 months, but the fontanelle is still pul pulsating, then there is um, a problem somewhere. Then uh, you have to also mind about uh, those kind of different abnormalities that happen on the fontanelle that is within the head and can be able to tell you exactly what is happening with this child meningitis and so forth can make the fontanel of these babies to bulge. So a bulging fontanel is a sign of infection or increased pressure on the head. And then um, the sunken or the depressed kind of uh, fontanel can give you an indication for uh, dehydration. So uh, sometimes you can use those kind of things to help you manage your patient in case they come and they're complaining and when you examine them you find such kind of deviations and then the face you have to assess also the face look at the face and what i'm looking at in the face you can see the eyes whether they are lined at the same level and you can look at the nose you can see whether it has two nostrils or it has only one even try to inspect inside and see some of them might be having some growth inside the nostrils. So you have to really check and see what is happening in the face of your patient so that you can be able to collect enough uh, objective data to help you come up with the right uh, a diagnosis for the management of your patient. So you look at all these normal and abnormal findings and document them so that you can be able to have a comprehensive um, assessment of your client. So the lesions overview, sometimes we have lesions and um, some of them can be due to certain infections or some of them might be just a normal kind of uh, lesion. So uh, the overview is basically a systematic approach to lesion inspection. So you have to look at those lesions uh, what is it all about? How do they look like? Uh, what is the size? How many are they? How, how are they dispersed in the body or on the skin? And all that will help you understand the type of lesion, the cause of the lesion, and how you're going to manage. So the morphology 
that's why I was like the size the distribution is how are they this dispersed are they distributed all over the body or they are basically in a certain position and then the characteristics of the skin lesion how is it looking like hmm? so all those things you have to look into if you see that your patient has a lesion look at uh, the morphology how big is it are they very small ones are they medium are they very big are they in all parts of your patient's skin or they are in a particular area um so in the lesion configuration are uh, the discrete so individual lesions are actually separate and distinct so you can see lesions don't look alike they are not the same you can have a lesion that is caused by a different um a different either pathogen or a different kind of infection so it will not be the same like the one that is caused by another thing so you can distinguish you can make a distinction between them and you can tell that this lesion is of maybe syphilis and this one may not be a lesion but it can be maybe a, a, a for scabies so you can tell because they don't actually look alike so each lesion has its own uh, kind of uh, distinction from the other and can help you to differentiate what kind of lesion the patient is having and what can be the cause then the grouped uh, lesions are clustered together so uh, clustered together are basically uh, they grow on top of the other and they come and heap themselves on one another making like a cluster those are the ones that are called grouped lesions then confluent lesions are uh, those ones have much uh, marking discrete lesions not visible or palpable so you can look at them but you cannot palpate them and you cannot um you cannot palpate them and even uh, you cannot have a, 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 a like when you try to touch them you can't see where is the margin of this lesion so some of them are that kind and you may be able to tell the cause of that lesion why it has what why it has happened in that way what could have caused it and so forth so lesions are basically those abnormal kind of growth they look like either boils like pimples they are just like growth on the skin but you can be able to to differentiate them depending on their character the way they are depending on um the the size and also depending on the what uh the morphology distribution and their characteristics so you can be able to tell what kind of relation the patient is having depending on those uh, few characteristics that i've mentioned and then non palpable lesions um, they are basically this kind of the macule and it changes in skin color but it is very small in size less than one centimeter so you can be able to tell that this is this kind of um, lesion then the patch the patch changes in skin color for it it changes in the skin color and that's why sometimes people say uh, you have the patient has some patches on the skin so the patches are basically uh, um, either change in the color if someone was dark then it starts getting uh, some kind of spot a uh, brown more than the normal color he has been having the dark color so those ones will be patches because they are not distributed in the entire body but they are basically in certain areas of someone's body and for that reason we have examples like the vitiligo vitiligo um I want to say uh, some of these patients have always realized uh, from nowhere that their colors have changed and they always talk about them they try to sensitize the community over the radios medias trying to tell them that this does not transmit but uh, some people actually fear patients with vitiligo and they think it is um, a transmittable a kind of infection but it is not so uh, someone can get up in the morning uh, from nowhere he sees that the face has changed the hands it has spots like a muzungu but only in some particular parts of the body not the entire body so that is called vitiligo and those ones are basically called the patches where the skin turns brown and it your dark and can distribute all over your body in different parts but not the entire skin will change 
but can distribute from the head, the hands, the legs, and all over. So uh, those people are always feeling out of place whenever they get this kind of uh, condition. So the palpable lesions, uh, they are saying this varies. Uh, some of them are solid. Some of them have, um, maybe they look like nodules. Some of them look like papules. Some of them are plague, but their sizes are different. So the papules, uh, in most cases, when you look at what's, what's, for example, uh, people have what's like women. Uh, we have seen most of the women when they come, um, they complain of some other growth that can be around the private area. But when you examine, you realize they are what's. So some of them end up not able to deliver and end up with season sections. So there are people who can come to you and they are not open. So that's why it is very important for us to inspect our patients. And no matter of the site, no matter of the area that they tell you they have a problem, go ahead and inspect. And when you inspect, you may be able to come up with something that can help you actually support this patient. So for the case of what, they may not tell you exactly what they are feeling and where it is, but what is one of the conditions that has uh, people to, to even fail to give birth normally. And then the plague, uh, plague uh, for example, they are giving the psoriasis and then the eczema. So those ones are basically looking like uh, some small, small nodules, just like almost the warts. So psoriasis for them even they are also close to each other like um, like uh, clusters. Then the nodules, these ones are solid, they extend deeper than the papules. So for them they are much more deeper than the papules and for them they even extend. They, they go bigger than uh, the warts. So it can even be a cancer. Um, there is a patient at uh, one time who came and she had it on the face. So she, she explained having had those things for like two years. And now when you have such kind of growth, even on your face uh, for two years, three years, then uh, you're trying to manage and you cannot manage. Uh, the skin doctors are trying to treat, but they cannot understand. Then you should start suspecting a cancer. So um, for example, they can be the lymphomas and that is a cancer they can be melanomas and it is a cancer so uh anything with mama <laughs> as you're seeing the lipoma that is a cancer and then um the melanoma is also a cancer of the skin lipoma is a cancer within the fats in our skins so it can cause this kind of uh, nodules on the surfaces of our skin and when you try to manage, you fail to manage, then go ahead and do other investigations, which may actually turn out to be a uh, cancer. Then the tumor, tumor uh, basically they are small, uh, smaller to a nodule, but they are more than two centimeters. For example, the advanced breast carcinoma. So um, we advise our women to always do breast examination and this one is mostly done under gynecological examination but uh, every woman is supposed to do post examination at least after every three months and also they advise them uh, every um after menses they have to examine their breasts and this one can help them to identify any kind of growth that is in their breast and manage it before it advances but now when it becomes a tumor, then now that one will be already advanced to breast cancer. So we have to do breast examination routinely for the case of women in order to rule out our breast cancer. And you never know, it may not be only for women, but even men uh, may get breast cancer depending. You can't tell what can happen. So uh, if also men can examine, they are better. But here we are mostly emphasizing uh, women to do breast examination so that they can be able to rule out um, some of these tumors to avoid advanced breast cancer. So encourage your women, encourage your sisters, encourage um, your relatives, your friends to do breast examination. 
Um, then the will, this one is basically localized edema that is causing irregular elevation. For example, insect bites, hives, and these ones you can look at um, the bees when they sting someone, they cause those kind of uh, uh, localized um, swellings uh, that people may call uh, maybe edema. And then also they can cause hives uh, when you get those bee stings. So it's advisable that whenever you have these bees, make sure that you avoid tampering with them because they can easily kill. Um, there are people who have always got these uh, bee stings and they have ended up even being hospitalized. So a bee can even kill like maybe animals, even people. Because by the time uh, the, the goat or the cow is trying to cry, uh, to mow, then it will just end up stinging even the tongue, the ears, it enters everywhere, including the human beings. So sometimes you can receive this kind of patients, they come to you and they have got those kind of uh, incidences where they have been bitten uh, by, by the, the bees, they have been stung by the bees and they have those kind of hives on their bodies. So you can be able to manage them in relation to um, maybe uh, allergies and so forth because uh, this kind of uh, substances that they put into somebody's body can also affect and sometimes can cause death. So some people have died because of the these things. And then the fluid filled cavities, uh, fluid filled cavities, uh, you realize that someone uh, may get either burn and when someone gets a burn, there is always fluid inside. So it is more or less like a blister that can form. So uh, when someone gets a burn and forms that blister, sometimes it is advisable not to burst the blister, but let it burst on its own so that it can even heal much more faster. And for them, the diameter is 0 0.5 centimeters viscose. That's how big they are. But depending on the severity of the burns and also the site or the amount of the skin that has been what gotten in contact with either the heat or the fire. So um, this will depend on the severity. Then the postules, the postules, this one's a vesicles uh, or the bullet, which is also part of the uh, dermatitis or the large burns. And they can be having pus. That is the worst bit of the postures. And uh, for the case of the newborns, the neonates, we have always realized that they come with these postures and is a sign of uh, infection and neonatal sepsis. So when they come, you realize this. They have this on their skins, and it is uh, having pus. It is like a boil, but it's on the surface of the skin but it has pus in it. And this baby sometimes can be even running fevers. So when they come with these pustules, make sure that you do other investigations on top of what you think so that you can be able to identify. We do like CBC so that you can be able to identify. If there is increased levels of white blood cells, then it can also show you there is an infection in this baby. So this can be ruled out as a neonatal uh, infection on your natal as uh, sepsis for the case of the newborns and they're the majority who always get this kind of um, postures. So they say they have like a chin which is more of a pimple but when you press it it has a uh, pus. So even adults get the arching and that is more of pimples on people's faces and when they press it releases pus. Then impetigo is also one of them. Then the cyst, some of us might have heard about the cyst or may have never seen, but we just hear, or others may have seen, had, and also got an experience of having a cyst. So this is basically encapsulated kind of fluid filled or semi-solid mass. For example, the sebaceous cyst. So it is just like something which is enclosed and has either a fluid inside it. But when you press it, it is hard. But when you incise it, you realize there is a release of some fluid that has been enclosed into it. 
So uh, once to see what is on the above our skin surface. So on the above skin surface, um, we believe that uh, there are some scales for some people who can have like a scales on top of their skin. And that is uh, more of either dandruff and people have those dandruff, especially on the scalp, on the head. So it's not good for you not to clean your head, not to clean your hair, not to clean the scalp because it can end up with dandruff and the dandruff can make even the hair to the head to itch. So you see somebody scratching their head, especially as the women. When you don't clean your head, you don't wash your hair, you end up with dandruff. And when there is dandruff all the time, the head is itching and they are scratching. So the scales of the skin in your hair will always be damaged and will be the one which will be getting off and causing that itching because of it. So it is important for us to always have um, clean scalps, uh, the skin on our scalps so that we avoid a uh, dandruff. Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of things that you would understand on the above skin, the crust, the erosions, erosions is especially the loss of the epidermis when there is any rupture, like for the case of the chicken pox vesicles. And I talked about chicken pox. Some people sometimes can mistake chicken pox to be scabies and scabies to be chicken pox. But good enough, for the case of chicken pox, they are bigger and scabies are smaller. For those who have ever seen and have ever experienced them. So you can be able to differentiate this kind of erosions on our skin so when uh someone gets this chicken pox it can rupture and when it ruptures it wears off that skin and leaves the place to look like a wound so that is what we call the erosion and the ulcer which is depressed lesion of the epidermis and upper dermis layers and it has different stages one to four and it will tell you the different types of ulcers depending on the layers that have been damaged so you have the pressure ulcers and so forth so the pressure ulcers is basically when someone has overlaid on the bed for the patients who are bedridden for a long time due to that friction between the bed and the and the body it ends up wearing at uh, that child's skin and the person ends up with developing those are uh, pressure ulcers which we call pressure sores at times so uh, those ulcers are sometimes um, caused around the buttocks, around the, the sacrum, around uh, the areas that are prominent. That's where always these uh, pressure ulcers develop in. So the rest of this are just um, in addition to what we have already mentioned. You can have a scar. As a condition of the skin but this is basically in relation to fibrous tissues after injury so when someone gets injured either gets an accident or he gets into surgery when that part heals that develops an what ulcer then keloids are uh, keloids people have always gotten keloids on the face around the neck and then also people prick the ears when you prick your ears and you react you end up with a keloid so this is like an abnormal kind of growth that happens where there is an injury or trauma in the skin. So when someone gets a trauma on his skin, some of them react differently. So there are people who react and respond in a way that they develop keloids. So keloids are basically excess collagen formation. So instead of the collagen are forming in a normal way to heal the wound, much of it and ends up in excess and forms what is called a keloid. An example is those people who have them on the ears. And I think we have ever seen people have keloids, they prick the ear and instead of the ear healing, it grows beyond and forms um, some dangling tissue and that one is called a keloid around the ear lobe. So, for example, burn scars, also burns can develop uh, keloids. Someone can get a burn and heal very well, but there are those ones who can get burns and they end up developing keloids, depending on how your body uh, responds to certain injuries. Then expiration, 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 this is loss of epidermal layers, for example, abrasions. 
so we can understand that and I know we know what it means so the rest of the things basically are not different from the other but you want to talk about the burn types and the burn types are the ones that are even very dangerous depending on the degree of the burn so we have the first uh, to the fourth degree of the burn so the first degree of the burn is basically um the skin it is just on the surface of the skin and for it has not even done the entire um, uh, epidermis then the second one it has damaged the epidermis and gone uh, maybe to the dermis slightly then the third one has gone to the dermis but the fourth one that one goes direct up to even the bone tissues so the fourth degree of burns is very dangerous and that one kills most of the people but also the first degree is so painful because it has uh, injured the nerves and the nerves are always responsible for coordinating the pain so when someone gets the first degree of burns he can also feel a lot of pain because of the injury on the nerves on the surface of the skin so um i think uh, we are ending here you'll be able to get these notes read them understand them and also research more don't only depend on these slides because when you read the slides it will give you something narrow that you may not be able to explore but when you read these slides it will only guide you to research more to pick more information to enrich your understanding so i want to say that um it has been a short one for today and um we have ended here i hope tomorrow we shall have more other two sessions for the weekend so um we have ended our session for now thank you